Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this um, lecture, which is a first for 2024. Our lecture series for 2024 uh, is launched by a very, very intriguing and innovative topic, research topic. But before that, I would like to uh, wish you all, uh, on behalf of all my colleagues at Mia, Pascalis, Costa, Sophia, and our leadership and the colleagues at the University of Bergen, a great new year, prosperous, healthy, and very, very creative. F. Economu, Dr. Economu, uh, is an archaeologist and curator at the National Archaeological Museum. She uh, obtained her BA and PhD at the Aristotle University uh, in Thessaloniki and her master's uh, from Southampton College uh, University in Milan. And since uh, 2020, uh, 2003, she's with the uh, Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports, where we actually met. So we worked together for a short period uh, at the Directorate of Museums, Exhibitions, and um, Educational Programs, uh, where she left in 2013 uh, to go to, to join the uh, National Archaeological Museum. Uh, she is currently curator at the Department of Vases, Metalworks, and Minor Arts Collection, and a researcher, which I believe she loves a lot. Um, this is how the topic emerged. Efti is also um, in a European research project, which is the um, the context for this uh, for this lecture tonight, and her research uh, interests. Um, focus on burial uh, methods, burial practices, ancient burial practices, especially from uh, the area of uh, ancient Macedonia in the fourth and third uh, century. She looks at burial contexts and she examines uh, powders and uh, medicinal uh, minerals from burial contexts, uh, female, especially female, from the fourth and third century uh, BCE. This is a very promising work, so we wish her all the best, and we hope to have her again in the future to uh, present us uh, new results. In the meantime, uh, we will uh, enjoy um, Constructing Whiteness, the Psymetheon of the National Archaeological Museum. So I think the floor is yours, and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delia, for this uh, warm welcome. Uh, please allow me to start uh, with a few words about how this research began. In 2017, the former director of National Archaeological Museum, Dr. Maria Lagoyani, asked me to explore the issue of facial and body care in antiquity. In the context of the exhibition under preparation, the countless aspects of beauty in ancient art, it was then that, the first, that I first realized that apart from fake observations, there had not been a thorough investigation of grooming in ancient Greece. There had been no identification of the substances used, neither an analysis of their composition and thus of their properties. However, these substances were not only the key to our knowledge on beautification, but also to our understanding of the achievements in healthcare in antiquity. Doesn't work. No, it still doesn't work. Can I do it? Shall I do it from the PC? The paper in the exhibition's catalogue was the starting point for a long-term and fruitful, full fruitful cooperation with Dr. Effie Photos Jones, Senior Honorary Researcher Fellow at the University of Glasgow, whom I warmly th thank because she introduced me to a whole new world, that of scientific analysis complementing the archaeological research. The lecture is part of a broader study and presents the results of archaeological and archaeometric research on material remains in the National Archaeological Museum. This research aims to address new archaeological questions. 
The relentless pursuit of beauty manifested via the application of mineral pigments and botanical substances of different colors is a female attribute that continues unabated, albeit in constantly changing forms from an undefined period of human history to the present day. For the 5th to the 3rd century BC, the flawless fair skin with no visible imperfections was an aesthetic requisite, also an indication of social status, since it was only women of aristocratic background who could sustain and an ideal unblemished pale skin by merely keeping out of sunlight. For the females of lower classes, this ideal could be emulated only via the use of colorants, in this case, the color white. So extensive was its apparent use by women of all ages and across social boundaries that religious temples felt obliged to list it amongst the items that women were not allowed to wear on entering their premises or participating in their activities within. For example, at the sanctuary of Jain in Achaia, 3rd century BC, felt compelled to include the Psimithion in a list of items a woman was not allowed to wear upon entering the temple and during the festival in honor of Demeter. In this list, except from Psimithion, included gold weighing more than a noble, a broider or purple garments. If any of these rules were violated, the shrine had to be purified and the woman concerned deemed Ibaius. Similarly, at the sanctuary of Andania in the Peloponnese, first century C, Psimithion was banned together with gold jewelry, red dye, hair bands, tagged hair or shoes. These strict prohibitions, aiming at making women to look modest, resemble the restrictions that still apply today when visiting a religious place. The material to implement the whitening, as well, the whitening as well as the covering of any skin defect was lead carbonate Greek psimithium, a workshop produced synthetic material whose recipe for manufacture is given in full in Theophrastus in the 4th century BC. Such was the demand that the manufacture was standardized in pellets of 3 cm in diameter. For the period in question here, evidence for attitudes and practices in the use of psimithion comes from the documentary sources. This pursuit takes place often against prevailing mores, that is to say, despite the strong reproof by men against women using mineral and botanical substances for beautification. This tradition spans the classical period till Byzantine times. In the 10th century le lexicon of Suda, psimithion is defined as color of the prostitutes, while church fathers, for example Gregorius Nanzianzinus, berate women who attempt to embellish themselves in any way. The link of the female body with whiteness from the 5th to the 3rd century BC is also reflected in the archaeological records. Around 470 BC, a change in the iconography of vessels emerges as new pigments begin to be used for coloring garments and objects and a brighter white than the traditional white coating begins to be employed for coloring the female skin. The Achilles painter, a pioneer vase painter of white lithoid, employs a white pigment whiter than the background to render the flesh areas of the female body. Along with the vase painting, pigment residues of white color are found as condens in boxes like Espixides, Lecanides, even Scyphoi in mainly female burials. In order to comprehend the concept of whiteness in the ancient Greek society from the 5th to the 3rd century BC, we should pay attention to the perception of it as a symbol of racial determination by the ruling class and this is a vehicle to set up an entire mechanism of dominance and exclusion. Lefron Andron, who then offers, as Macarius mentions, an apostolius adds the explanation epiton apracto, those who do not do anything, any job. Therefore, by not being exposed to the sun and the wind, keep their skin lefko, white. In the following text, Pentheus describes Dionysus as an exceedingly beautiful youth, exciting pothos, but rather woman is according to the perceptions of the established mentality. For your hair is long, not through wrestling, scattered over your cheeks, full of desire, and you have a white skin from careful preparation, ending after Aphrodite by your beauty not exposed to strokes of the sun, but beneath the shade. The condemnation of such whiteness, generally associated with non-involvement in any useful task, any outdoor labor, and particularly connected with effeminacy by the comic poets, appears again and again in various contexts. 
On the contrary, an example of the impact of the whiteness upon men is a woman with the ideal feminine characteristics embodies Penelope, Odysseus's wife, as she appears in front of the shooters with modesty, as prospective bride, their knees buckled, the hairs were, were beguiled with desire, and they all prayed to lie down beside her. Women's desire to have or maintain a fair skin appears to have run deeply within agriculture, as one can gauge from the Homeric poems. The poet addresses the adjective Lefkolenos, white-armed, mainly to the goddess Hera, together with the epithetic phrase Vopis Potnia Iri, Oxide Lady Hera. However, with the same characterization, he refers to the exemplary women who behave according to the rules and act within the allowed social framework. By the common use of this adjective, the mortal women resemble the prototypical bride and wife of the divine pantheon, who, with her positive and negative attitudes, allowed only to the goddesses, keeps her house stable despite the upheavals. All these women are described acting within their oikos, therefore, they preserve their alluring fairness. Surprisingly, from the Homeric whiteness attributed to the queens of Achaeans, paradigmatic women of modesty, faith, and charm, not even Helen is excluded, who due to her irrational behavior led so many Achaeans to Hades. As White Armed is described when Iris found her in her chamber, weaving a great wet with the achievements of her guides and Trojans. Obviously, <laughs> Helen deviates from the model of ideal wife and virtuous woman, though her involvement with the typical feminine activities to, is proved sufficient for her identification. After all, her indecent behavior was not resulted by her free will, but by divine seduction. White arm is attributed to women from Argos, Troy, such as Andromache, or Phaeacians, for example, Arete and Afsica indiscriminately, all of them of upper class, prudent, faithful, obedient, but of different age groups, therefore linked to different actions derived by their age and different implications. Lefkolenos Nafsika, for example, who plays unveiled together with her maid servants, is an attempt desirable Parthenos, thus vulnerable, whereas her mother Ariti is a queen with confidence, wisdom, who rules with justice. On the other hand, this epithet could not ever characterize women such as Kirki or Calypso, who, despite their attractiveness and their wisdom, are transgressed the rules for conventional Greek womanhood. Moreover, texts from the ancient tragedies interweave the whiteness with the state of transition from Parthenos to Gini, implying not the beauty, but mainly the vulnerability of women at that time, for example, Euripides Midere or Sophocles Antigone. The correlation of whiteness with vulnerability is more pronounced in the case of an impending death, as the part of the body about to be injured stands out for its whiteness. Therefore, whiteness is not identified only with beauty and allure, but also with vulnerability, which indeed as such could even be attractive. Aristotle, for the first time, relates the pleasure of a woman to the fluid secretion that she produces during intercourse. But this pleasure is reinforced by the color of, the, of her skin, since this happens in light skin and feminine women, as Lefkochrois and Thilikes, generally speaking, and does not happen in dark and manly looking women. All these assertions derived by the literary sources from the Homeric poetry till the classical age connote that the feminine beauty is a construction in the related to the degree of control exercised over them. The conquest and preservation of the ideal beauty, as it was imposed by the art of antiquity and the social demands, was undeniably one of the main concerns of women. Before cosmetics, it is perhaps Psimithion's whiteness that forms the focal point of its attributes, as can be gleaned from the earliest reference to it by a fragment of Xenophanes, of Xenophanes dated as 6th to 7th century BC. On the basis of its inherent characteristic, namely the color white, whiteness becomes historically invested with social and moral implications. Thus, the whiteness of the skin, as the principal element of the ideal beauty, emerges as a control mechanism for women. In cases where the whiteness is the result of a particular process and not the natural outcome of confinement, 
it provokes male opposition, with a characteristic example being the conservative Aristophanes. The use of Psimithion, therefore, is treated as an attempt at deception and evidence of his sufficient control, as revealed by the sources. A closer look at the references to Psimithion as face whitening in ancient Greek sources are instructive. The practice of lightening of the face with Psimithion appears in Xenophon Economicus. Well, one day, Socrates, I noticed that her face was made up. She had wrapped in white lid in order to look even whiter than she is, and Alcan Jewish to whitening the rosy color of her cheeks, and she was wearing boots with thick soles to increase her height. Also, a witness of his state is stated, has anyone a dark complexion? White lid will that correct. However, its application should be exercised with caution, lest the lady in question by become the object of ridicule. Are you an ape plastered with white lid, or the ghost of some old hag returned yeah. from the dark borderlands of death? The <coughs> shorter comments in his Ecclesiastes. The implication being that Psimithon was applied by some women for the sole purpose to deceive men, covering their age. No, no, as she is there, she can still deceive, but if this white lid is washed off, her English will come out plainly, Aristophanes in a state in his Plutus. In general, and still according to Aristophanes, women try hard to beautify. Then it is for not that I have painted myself with white lead, dressed myself in my beautiful yellow robe, or same on your painted cheeks, both passages from Aristophanes' Ecclesiastes. The scratching attitude towards women using cosmetics is attested at the Roman literature as well. According to the text by Lucian, women are so ugly when they wake up in the morning, and as a result they are isolated, surrounded only by old women or maid servants, ugly as well, who are taking care of their ill favorite faces by using an assortment of medic medicaments instead of using purely water. Particularly interesting, therefore, is men's perception not only of how women spend their time when in the company of other women, but also of their physical appearance, which is so repulsive that they are compelled to deceive by constructing a false image. Beyond cosmetics, it appears that one way to discredit an Athenian woman's reputation for being virtuous was to allude to her wearing Psimithion at the wrong, at the wrong time. But it struck me, sirs, that she had powered her face with Psimithion, though her brother had died not thirty days before. Even so, however, I made no remark on the face, but left the house in silence. The text is by Elysia's title on the murder of Eratosthenes. Men applying Psimithion on themselves appear to have been frowned upon. She adorned his, his meaning Alcibiades, face, like a woman's, with paints and pigments, the use of Psimithion by males is also attested by Ctesias, a 5th century BC Greek physician. He covered his face and a dire body with Psimithion, employing the beautifying practices of the hetere to make them softer than any tender woman. By the Roman period, the use of Kerusa seems to have been more widely accepted. Yet, old beliefs die hard. You dye your head, but you will never disguise your old days, nor straighten out the English in your cheeks. Don't cover your face with serusa so as to have a mask and not a face, for it avails nothing. Why are you so foolish? Paint and dye would make her Cuba a Helen. There is also an additional use of Psimithion as a healthcare product. Regarding pharmacological application, the Hippocratic Corpus of the 5th to the 4th century BC clearly points to Psimithion's use for external applications. It was dispensed for eye ailments with spodium, saffron, and myrrh, for ear discharge with santar and flower of silver, for ulcers mixed with olive oil, resin, pine bark, and animal fat, also for gynecological applications as a suppository on a piece of wool soaked with water. Finally, as an eblastron, wool dressing, and in association with other metallics, nice gold scoria, rusted copper. Another medical author, Diocles, 4th century BC, includes it in a recipe for eye ailments together with other metallics like pomphoelix. Whereas the preferential use of the pigment psimithion as a cosmetic, health care, and with medical applications is well attested in the 5th and 4th century BC literature, 
there is very little suggestion so far that for the period concerned, Psimithion was used as a pigment in art or architecture. In our tracing of Psimithion in material culture, we examined by XRF the white pigment used to depict female figures, and mainly the white parts, as face, arms, neck and feet, on contemporary Lykithoi in the vast collection of the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The results suggest that Psimithion was not used as a white pigment for these vases. Despite the overspread notion that Psimithion is a very common toy tree, its scarcity as an offering within female burials is an impressive observation, since only in a very few cases was traced. The Psimithion was mainly preserved in clay pixides, but there are cases of lead and brooch as well. Other vessels used as containers of these cosmetic substances are lecanides, scyphoid, and scyphoid kilics, while silver cells are also tested. In some cases, Remains of Psimithion were found on the ground, since their container was not preserved due to its organic material. The Psimithion is preserved as pellets or as a powder. However, in Theophrastus' prescription, there is no mention of how they were formed into pellets. What was then the necessity that led to the standardization? Was it a matter of consumer's preference or rather a practical choice in order to facilitate their widespread distribution? The scarcity of these findings, however, may not be indicative, as it may be due to the loss of material during the excavations. From the distribution of Psimithion in female burials across Greece, from Macedonia to the Peloponnese, it is clear that it was widely available. Whether manufactured in selected centers and distributed widely, or available in many small centers and distributed locally, it is not possible to ascertain. Its monetary value was not higher than two oboloi, as Amipsias mentions, at the late 5th century BC, so it could not have been perceived as an expensive item. Tor knowledge remains or actual, actual Psimithion was traced in 33 burials, the most of them being severely disturbed. The burials, dated from the classical to the Hellenistic period, range from the simplest graves, pit graves, tile graves to sarcophagus and the more elaborate Macedonian tombs. The majority of the burials were females as indicated by the context and the skeletal remains. Moreover, Psimithion was unearthed in two male burials. The first is an actor's tomb named Macareus at Keramaiko Cemetery. This offering accompanies him as a professional equipment indicating the roles he performed. The second burial belongs to a doctor buried in Pydna. It might serve as the basis for a pharmaceutical prescription that may be needed in the afterlife. The grave goods that furnished the burials with Psimithion were typical of their era and the gender of the deceased. Assemblages of figurines were among the most common offerings, which probably expressed perception and ideas about life, death and religion. Moreover, Uguendaria and Earth, which, just like Likithoi, were closely connected to burial practices, since they serve not only as offerings but also as utilitarian objects during the burial ceremony. In fact, the association of Guentari and Likithoi with incense oils has been confirmed by archaeological remains. Some burials were adorned with knuckle bones, games associated with moments of relaxation and entertainment, as well as lots for pred predicting the future and amulets. The presence of strigils in female burials is rather intriguing. In these cases, probably the strigil was used as a medical instrument for applying remedies, suggesting knowledge of healing practice that bring wellness to the body. Finally, among the offerings are also listed mirrors, the internal symbol of femininity. The presence of luxurious offerings in the entirety of undisturbed burials alludes to upper social status women who were interred with great care as a seal of social memory. Among these women were the ladies whose Psimithia are housed in the National Archaeological Museum. The link of Psimithion as an identifying characteristic with the female gender is pervasive in ancient Greek literature, as have already been established. In fact, whiteness represents throughout antiquity the epitome of charm and beauty. The finds under investigation are housed in the vast collection of the National Archaeological Museum. 26 pellets, complete or fragmented, preserved in a large pixies, and 47 
also complete and fragmented pellets in the miniature pixies. It is not clear whether this fragmentation resulted by use or it was due to burial conditions. The two vessels were unearthed together in the foundations of a house across from the Polytechnic School, Patician Street in Athens. On the body of the Lark Pixies, there is a depiction of woman's quarter, while on the lid a bud of fege dot pattern surrounds a reef of ivy leaves. It is attributed to the painter of Athens, 1787. On the body of the miniature Pixies, there is a depiction of a hare, a feline and swans, while on the lid there are three female heads alternating with anthemia, surrounded by a band of fege dot pattern, both dated to 410 till 400 BC. Another group is composed of 36 also loose complete fragments of pellets from a cemetery at Anagra in Boeoshi. They are dated by association to the end of the 5th till the end of the 4th century BC based on the chronology of the tombs in the Tanagra cemetery. The presence of such a large quantity of psimithia, especially from different burial contexts at the National Archaeological Museum, is particularly significant considering that this is not a common burial find, as has already been detailed. Regarding Psimithion's nature, properties, and method of manufacture, the sources are eloquent. Psimithion was assumed to be brilliant, snow white. Its whiteness was, was its principal element. The same notion of good ought to be manifested in all of them, just as the same notion of white is manifested in snow and in Psimithion. As it is attested by Aristotle in his Ethics. The description by Theophrastus at 4th century BC regarding the manufacturing process of this skevaston, workshop produced product, is detailed not only in terms of the required time, but also regarding its basic elements. Lid, molybdos, about the size of a brick, is placed in a jar, pithos, over poor wine, oxos. And when this acquires a thick mass, which generally does in 10 days, then the jar is opened and a kind of mold Evros is separated off the lid, and this is done again until it is all used up. The part that is scrapped off is ground in a mortar and decanted frequently, and what is finally left at the bottom is white lid. As part of the research, diagnostic, not destructive analyses were conducted on the entire collection of Psimithia in the National Archaeological Museum using PXRF followed by XRD analysis on very fragmentary preserved disks from all three pixies. These analyses confirm the presence of mainly serocyte, with hydrocerocyte not exceeding 1 to 3 percent. Therefore, psimithion is almost pure serocyte. The detection of a high quantity of argyros may indicate that the psimithia originate from a metal source rich in argyros, Laurium, region of Attica, being the most likely area of origin. The research question that arises, however, is which parameters control the production of serocyte in the vessel mentioned by Theophrastus. The described 10-day production cycle of Psimithion was two, has two main reactants, lead, which is suspended, and oxos, which is pure white with living microorganisms and not vinegar in which nothing survives. In a recent article of ours, it was proposed as a working hypothesis that this biotic component of oxos constitutes the driving force for the production of carbon dioxide, which may have been the determining factor in serocyte production. The biotic component is made up of microorganisms, both aerobic, activated as long as there is oxygen in the vessel, and anaerobic, which take action when the oxygen is depleted actively changing the chemistry of the oxus. These changes result in changes in the gas phases via the production of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and acetic acid vapor, which in turn have a different effect on the reactions on the surface of the lid, where various crystal phases are formed, including lead carbonate. All the other phases either transform into lead carbonate or are water-soluble and are also dissolved in water during friction and washing as described by Theophrastus. Therefore, according to our proposed hypothesis, the conditions prevailing in Theophrastus' closed jar induced chemical changes during the 10-day cycle. Active, 
and inactive microbial communities within the oxus controlled the composition of the gaseous phase and were subsequently controlled by it. This dynamic condition must have been well understood by the people who manufactured psimethium. Any intervention, even a simple opening of the container during a certain stage of the 10-day cycle, allowing a greater amount of oxygen to enter, would alter the dynamics and could potentially result in the production of more hydrocerucide as opposed to cerucide, which is the main crystal phase found in psimethium. The described control of equilibrium in order to produce cerucide in combination with standardization regarding the form, size and weight of Psimethion of the National Archaeological Museum indicates the existence of an industry with complete knowledge of the practice that must be followed its time as well as the interaction of various materials. The empirical knowledge of the people who manufacture the Psimethion, not only of the rates but especially their ability to fully control them, is highly impressive. In modern terms, terms, we could therefore be talking about knowledge of biotechnology. In conclusion, the word psimethion is a conventional term in research connoting improperly all the colored pigments instead of the white lead-based substances. By the literary sources of the era under consideration, it is attested that the use of psimethion is directly related to the construction of women's identity within a social framework of strict control over them. This control aimed to maintain the purity of an oikos and assure legitimate offspring for its succession. Due to this prominent perspective, the presence of psimethion in burials is in interpreted as a declaration of feminine coquetry inherent in the female nature that persists even in the afterlife. The psimethion was preserved in burials across Greece. This apparent broad-based market availability contrasts sharply with its scarcity within female burials. The 33 burials furnished with psimethion appear to be an exception. The loss of material during the excavations, and especially that which was disposed without container, is an obvious reason, but there may also, may also be an additional factor. It is possible that a shared identity among women dictated the necessity of the presence of psimethion to these specific tombs. Alongside the archaeological conclusions, the analysis conducted on the psimethia at the National Archaeological Museum provided invaluable insights into, the, into this Skevaston product, possibly the first workshop produced synthetic material in the Hellenic region associated with hygiene. Primarily, they confirmed the existence of organized laboratory units and the profound knowledge of the artisans of the air under consideration, especially regarding the range and dynamics of chemical reactions taking place in a controlled environment. Simultaneously, they demonstrated their ability to fully control these processes. The biotechnological knowledge of antiquity is a vast field that has opened up in the research, and it is certain that there will be impressive results in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, I think, for this uh, interdisciplinary presentation combining hard facts and a lot of cultural knowledge uh, spanning from biotechnology to gender studies. Would you like to stay yes, of course. and uh, receive questions from the audience mm -hmm. and have some discussion on the topics that you uh, touched upon? I'd like to ask if you have found any of these genetic uh, material uh, in other contexts than uh, sanitaries, household, for example, Sandorini, where you have this amazing preservation. No, nothing. The thing is that we do not have any leftovers from uh, non burial contexts. Yeah. No, or the... maybe they didn't notice when they were excavating. Yeah, maybe, but uh, given that uh, there is a huge uh, dist uh, distribution of the earth, it's uh, very difficult to understand and to find and to trace them. But uh, in contrast to the burial offerings that are covered so are well cared, it's uh, more easy to find. Uh, so you always things. find uh, in the way you saw in the picture something like pieces. Or powder. Yeah, or powder, or powder, ah. and yeah. that's the case. Maybe some powder was lost 
so that was found uh, within burial uh, during the archaeological research. But still, if we uh, have uh, take into consideration how many of the uh, female burials uh, throughout Greece, the number 33. Very small. It's very small. Mm -hmm. Given that we have a lot of material, we know that. It, it could be 75. For example, I don't think that it would be an enormous number. It would be because uh, the other Psynithia uh, might have been, uh, you know, from plants and they didn't survive. I don't know, but this is the, uh, the main point of our research. Uh, we have to be very careful with uh, the definition. Mm -hmm. uh, when we say psimithia, uh, the only thing that we should describe from now on that we know we have the knowledge is uh, this skevaston war produced product yeah. uh, that is in the jar for 10 days and, and is lead based. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's lead based. Mm -hmm. This is the only thing because we have the now in the archaeology we use the, this term in order to describe all the colorants mm -hmm. of all colors, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. And we knew that it was wrong since Theophrastus. Mm -hmm. so, okay. mm -hmm. Yes, please. I'm really intrigued about the health uh, aspects, the healthcare aspects. Uh, because uh, uh, as we've seen uh, to, to, in today's transition of uh, modern Western medicine, there's, there's a slowly transition into using traditional methods uh, of uh, healthcare. Yes. Uh, the Asians have a longer you know, tradition, uh, but I know given what you said, obviously Greece has a very, you know, uh, long history of, yes. of using traditional medicine. Now, is this a, an area that you or your colleagues or others in, in uh, the archeological field are putting attention on in terms of, you know, how can we bring back some of the, some of the things that were lost, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that were uh, had a negative connotation. For example, the old wives tale, the old, you know, you see what I'm saying? Uh, you know, there is this uh, negative connotation in a bit uh, when the transition uh, yeah. started and, and all of that was sort of lost because of you know, modern Western medicine. Now, is, is that coming you know, to fore? Are, are there now uh, people like yourself and, and colleagues that are looking into this? Uh, because, uh, you know, what you just mentioned, for example, the Biotechnology. I mean, I mean that quite an you know quite a uh, elaborate process uh, to make uh, this mineral. No. So likewise, you know, if they took this much care in cosmetics, mm -hmm. then they must have taken this much care in healthcare. It's so true. Is, is that uh, yeah. we are very uh, we are very fortunate today because uh, it happens to be here with us a uh, healthcare expert. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Vespina Ignatiadou is the head of sculpture collection and I would like to have the opportunity to thank her as well for this research, for our long discussions and mainly for our disagreements. <laughs> Vespina, yes, would uh, you like to answer that? I'm working on the on the medicinal part of the Tsimithia. We are both in a, a big team which is has two groups. So I'm working for the medicinal part. Uh, we were very surprised to find in, uh, in ancient Greek uh, um, uh, prescriptions, uh, mainly by Hippocrates or as early as Hippocrates, uh, the use of uh, Psymethium as a base for the prescriptions, very clearly. Uh, and this lasts until uh, um, the Roman period adopted that. Uh, where we are working in for, for the Roman period, we are working with the Roman doctor who, who is called Scribonius in Arcus. And uh, Scribonius is the first who gives um, uh, all the parts of, uh, of the prescriptions, but also with weights, with quantity. Well, 
Hippocrates does not do so. So uh, in both the first century AD and the fifth, fourth century BC, we have the, um, uh, the Psimithion uh, as a base. And then they add a lot of other ingredients. Um, what, uh, what, is, what is the first thing that we realize about this is that um, because it, is, it contains lead, it is not necessarily harmful. Mm. It's the first thing. And we usually have questions like this. Um, the second is that, uh, of course, they know uh, by practice uh, how uh, this um, this ingredient can be beneficial to health, because um, uh, if it doesn't kill the person, it kills all the bacteria. <laughs> so they have to find the equilibrium <laughs> between these two. Uh, yes, it's a very complicated um, uh, ancient uh, biotechnology, uh, and we have. Um, we admire it at the moment, and we are trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard to understand it. We try really hard. I don't know which one of you to ask, so I'll ask both of you, I suppose. <laughs> uh, first question, purely practically, um, do we know how these pellets were actually used? I mean, were they pounded and suspended in liquid, or? No, no, they were used as they are. Man, probably crushed. or crushed or by uh, yeah. As today. Yeah. yeah, as we do today. Okay, it's our makeup. So makeup. Um, is there any experimental work being done trying to replicate this material? Yeah. Yes, this is what uh, we're doing now, yeah. and we're doing and it's successful. <laughs> it it was very successful. Give you a demonstration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. We will, we will party. Yeah. It sleeps in Glasgow, no? <laughs> yeah. We have probably we have the third party in line. I don't know if she has <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Which brings me to an idea we, we had with uh, Dr. Zafiriadis at some point to have a conference on ancient um, medicinal uh, ethos and practices. So that might be an idea to. Uh, Sort of endorse today and promise that uh, maybe in the next couple of years we could uh, join forces together with Norwegian scholars and uh, I hold something really interesting concerning what we were just now discussing. Of course, we would love it. I love the talk. I have never thought about all the things that you, you both mentioned. Now the question is completely different from the previous ones. It concerns the prohibitions in the temples. How far back do they go? And do they concern all of Greece or just certain parts of the United Kingdom? Well, I don't know exactly. We have uh, two cases here. The first one is dated of the fourth century BC. And the second one is fourth um, century AD, which means that expands a period of time and uh, maybe it's indicative of what is happening during the whole period in, uh, across Greece. I have a question from our online, online attendance. Uh, it's about uh, whether they are similar finds or relevant finds from the island in Crete. The the what was the question again? If we have a relevant find from the island, relevant findings like the methane findings can create. I I haven't been found any Ipsimithian uh, recorded from Great. I don't. Yeah. And Yet. Is, and then another question. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts about the implications if these properties they can be contextualized and be historicized and used for supporting the agents of covering the world and the discussion about skin color to the social security. Big talk. Big discussion. Yes, this is a huge discussion. How can we discuss it like that? 
I want you to. But he has wondered already. He has thought about all the implications. Yeah, we, we, we have thought about many implications. We don't know if we have thought about all the implications. If this is only a social construction, if this is a religious factors dictated the, the presence, uh, but this is a main question of the research. Why the, this form alterates in terms of burial sphere? And here is our discussion with. Uh, Doctor Ignatiazzo and disagreement. There's disagreements over here. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a final, if there's nobody else, um, a final question. Your thesis was about iconography in burial uh, monuments of uh, Macedonia, uh, which was published in 2001. So it's quite like 20 years uh, before. Are there any links to, to that research you were doing? The Have you found any evidence? No, uh, this is a whole new it is. research. I know, and course. the only connection is that uh, one Psimithion was uh, found in uh, Macedonian uh, tomb. tomb. Yeah. Can you disclose where or is it something? I, I cannot remember okay. right now. Where was do you remember? I don't, I don't remember. So you have now. one example from uh, uh, yeah, it was one example from uh, from Thessaloniki. Yeah. And was it in iconography or was it no, in no, an no. object? It's an but object. It, okay. uh, we cannot. Uh, we do not find it in iconography. Okay. Nothing. Nothing there. Nothing there. Yeah. That's my question. And uh, does anything else? Thank you so much for uh, attending. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's continue. One of them. Thank you very much. Sharing this, and we honestly mean it. We will bring you here again to share uh, your results and maybe creating something. Thank you. Bigger. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. In less than 10 or 20 years. Uh, 10 years are okay for a given that the previous time was 10 years ago. <laughs>